Breck was talking about how powerful it was that God doesn't waste anything. Um, that if you follow that story along in uh, Mark chapter 6 is where he talks about the feeding of the 5,000. And he tells the disciples to go pick up the fragments of bread and the pieces of fish that are left over. And there were exactly how many left over? Twelve baskets full. And how many disciples were there? Twelve. Seems to be an object lesson for each one of them. But that's not the end of the story. The end of the story is that, the, that Jesus sent the disciples on ahead on the ocean. And in the third watch of the night, he sees them struggling against the oars because the wind is against them. So Jesus comes walking to them on the water. You say, what does that have to do with feeding 5,000 people and pick, picking up leftovers, broken pieces of bread, and, and eating pieces of fish? I'll tell you exactly what it has to do. Because God led them through a season, and the season was not just provision. The season was a season of God proving to them that I can do anything. That I can take what you have and I can multiply it. And not only is there going to just barely be enough, there's always going to be more than enough because I'm the God of abundance. And so here they are struggling against the waves. Jesus walks to them on the water, the same Jesus that had just done a miracle and multiplied loaves and fishes for 5,000 people, really more like 15,000 if you include women and children. And when he comes walking to them on the water, the same Jesus that multiplied the bread is walking on the water, but they can't get it. And when they see him walking on the water, they think they see a ghost and they're terrified. And so Jesus gets in the boat and rebukes them and, and because of their lack of faith. And it says that they did not understand about Jesus because they had not understood about the loaves and the fishes. How many times in our life do we get in a new season? And here we've gone through this season of a miracle from God and, and he's answered our prayer and we get this provision and then it seems like this thing where, why do we have to go pick up the leftovers? I mean, God's done a miracle, hallelujah, let the birds get it. I mean, God's more than enough. He wants to bless everyone and he uses you to do it. But God doesn't end the story at the end of the story that he uses the end of one story to start the beginning of the next. And the powerful thing about seasons as we walk through in God is that he builds on those seasons in our life. And so this morning as we begin this series on seasons, uh, in fact, I just, as Breck was talking about that, I was connected with it this week and praying through, so I'm just going to add a, a, another message to the series. Thank you for the outline. Amen. Everybody with me this morning? Okay, so let's talk a little bit about seasons and how significant they are in our life. Um, just a, a note here in your bulletin, I think there's a, a note there about small groups, which is kind of the beginning of a new season for us as a church. And uh, not a new season spiritually, but a new time to establish that. And here's what I want, you know, we're starting school, that's kind of a new season for us, uh, we're 20 days from the beginning of college football season starting, oh. okay, now we can go on, moment of silence, let's revere, uh, um, just kidding, and so uh, th there's, there's new seasons starting in the natural, here's what I want you to get right from the start. And at the time where we're transitioning into a new season, either naturally or spiritually, listen to me. When we're transitioning into a new season, it's important that we prioritize. And that we prioritize what's important and what's significant. Because if we don't prioritize the important... We'll, our season will be dictated by the urgent. Okay, I know I just jumped right in there teaching you, but don't miss the principle. Here's what happens. Have you ever got in a season where uh, you started, maybe it's school, maybe it's something in the natural, maybe it's starting a new job, maybe it's uh, a season of marriage, 
uh, that, that you enter into a new season and, and things change. We're entering a, a, a new season of being empty nesters. Hallelujah. Except we still got a chick in the nest or a whatever he is. Young, young rooster. We, we, have a, we still got one of our kids at home. So we're kicking him out next week and we'll totally start our new season. Just kidding. But, but in that transitional time, th- just because all our kids leave home doesn't mean that we just, okay, now what? If we don't prioritize what's important now, then we'll get in this time where, where we begin to experience some emotions and the results of this new season that we didn't necessarily expect. If we don't prioritize the important, if we don't pray it through, if we don't seek God and navigate a new season in word and spirit, we will enter into the new season in emotion and understanding which will create offense to us or to others because we react to the situation. We go through seasons of grief when we're impacted. When we navigate that season by word and spirit, we prioritize the importance of drawing into the heart of God and receiving from the Holy Spirit as our comforter, as our strength, as our sustainer. He gives us perspective on life. He, he brings us into the realm of the eternal. We begin to treasure the past, not live there, but look forward with expectancy to the future. That's why Scripture says... <clears throat> That when we go through a season of grief, we don't grieve as those that don't have hope. That in that midst of that season, we don't give up. And, and so God established seasons in our life to mark the, the significance of our life. Not the length of it and not the timing of it. But he gives us seasons to mark the seasons of spiritual growth in our life no matter what we're walking through. The dry season and the rainy season. The, the significance of that in other parts of the country, you know, they have uh, four seasons. And here we have two, hot and hellishly hot. And so, just kidding. But as we walk through that, we realize, wait a minute. Uh, he, my, my wife is such a woman of faith that she walked out on the porch yesterday afternoon in the midst of doing some things. And she came back in and she said, you know, it's almost cool enough that we can start sitting outside on the porch. And my first thought was, are you crazy? My second thought was, when you went through menopause, your thermostat got broke. My third thought was, you got so much more faith than I do. I'll meet you out on the porch when it's 50. Okay? So, so as we walk through that, how many of you know, sometimes there's just, it's not the season for that. It's not comfortable to do certain things in certain seasons. Don't miss it. God hasn't always called us to be comfortable. The scripture that Breck shared this morning, the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus made them all comfortable. He said they all ate as much as they wanted and were satisfied. And sometimes in those seasons where we're satisfied, we're we're not hungry, we're not driven by our appetite, or or we get a drink of water and we're not thirsty anymore, that, that spiritually Jesus used the same principles. When he stood and said, if any man thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And rivers of living water will flow from within him. And by that, he was talking about the Spirit. Jesus was going through seasons in their lives and seasons spiritually that the people didn't understand. And he was bringing them in to a season of grace because of the work he would do on the cross. But it was a season of horrific pain and difficulty for him knowing that it would bring us a season of pleasure and satisfaction and a season where his blessing would rest upon our life as we walked in his grace, not having to pay the penalty that he paid on the cross. Does everybody see it? And so when we see from the beginning that God established seasons, it's very important for us not to get so familiar with the word that, that it loses its meaning in our life. And that we mark our lives by seasons, but we need to step back and spiritually ask God, so what are you doing in this season? What what season am I in? And the interesting thing as we navigate that is that we can look across the congregation this morning, and there may be people in 30 different seasons of life. 
And you may share that with some others, and others are in a completely opposite season. Okay, we got newlyweds on the front row. That's a wonderful season of life. All the happily married people said? Then we got oldieweds. And we just don't have the strength and energy to do some of that crazy stuff like y'all are doing. Whatever it might be. You know, and so everything's exciting. Everything's new. But what happens when it becomes old? Can we see the beauty and the grace that we saw in the beginning? Can, can we take the attraction and, and the, the, the initial part of that and then begin to see that Scripture really is true when it says beauty doesn't come from the outward appearance and the adornment? What an incredibly beautiful bride. What an awesomely handsome groom. And the bride said, and so we had this beautiful ceremony, and God blessed it. And every wedding I've done has been striking at just the, the, the choices that they make. And there's this beauty and, you know, the, the look on the groom's face when he sees the bride for the first time. And whoo! Hey, we celebrated our anniversary, uh, 36 years in July. I celebrated my birthday, even more years than that, 50, how old am I? 56, I passed the speed limit in the 70s, and, and uh, that week while we were in Antigua, it's a great birthday present, happy birthday to me, thank you for the greetings, thank you for all of that, and, and so marking seasons of our life in a different way, but as we were standing there at the wedding, I thought back to our wedding in Commerce, Oklahoma, at First Assembly of God Church, and I could still see my wife with her long, beautiful hair and her wedding dress and all that coming down the aisle and feeling what was a forgotten memory because it was a different season. And God helped me understand that as He takes us through seasons, we, we don't miss the things we grow through if we take advantage of the season of spiritual growth. We never lose the spiritual fruit as we grow through the seasons. God doesn't waste anything. Okay? That that he takes that in our life and we don't realize that it's not for that moment, it's for this one. That God's taking us deeper and, and we don't need deep roots when we're getting an abundance of rain. When we need the deep roots, it's when it's dry and we're in a drought, and we need to draw from something deeper than just what's on the surface. Come on, somebody. So when we understand God's intention and God's purpose in that, it's a very powerful thing. Here's what uh, Scripture says about seasons. Genesis 1, 14. At creation, then God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, And let them be for signs and seasons, and for days and for years. Genesis 8, 22. God takes it a step further. And when he makes covenant with Noah uh, and gives him the promise, but also the power of covenant, the promise of the rainbow in the sky that I will never again destroy the earth, but also the power of covenant. Here's what it means. God establishes this as an... uh, Lifetime principle. God says to him, while the earth remains, or as long as the earth exists, there will be seasons. There will be seed time and there will be harvest. Seed time and harvest. They're two different seasons. A season of surrender and a season of abundance or receiving. And how we navigate those seasons depends on how we grow through them. It's God's covenant. As long as the earth remains, there will be seed time and harvest, seasons of cold, seasons of heat, winter and summer, day and night shall not cease. Solomon, as he wrote Ecclesiastes, wrote these words, For everything there is a season, and there's a time for every activity under heaven. For everything, there's a season. And then he goes through and names many of those. Daniel uh, answered in response to the king when God gave him a revelation of the king's dream. And seasons are not marked by 
dates and times, they're marked by revelation and truth in our life. We'll talk about that in just a moment. And so Daniel receives this revelation and he gives the response to the king, the interpretation of the dream. But then he makes this as his praise, as his declaration to God. Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changes the times and seasons. He changes the times and seasons. I I love the fact that when God brought uh, the Israelites out of bondage, one of the first things he did was change the times and seasons. And as he established his heart with them, he said, this month will be the beginning of months for you. In other words, God changed the whole calendar. If he spoke to them in uh, June, say, God said, now from now on, this is going to be January, because this is a brand new beginning. This is a brand new season. You've been in bondage and captivity for a long season, 400 years, but now you're going to be in freedom, and this is going to be the marker of it, is this going to be freedom season, and, and this marks the first of your year, and it was a holy time in the Jewish calendar, still celebrated as that, still the significance of it, because when God changes times and seasons, he establishes our hearts back in his covenant, and he brings us back to the principle of first. What we do first determines what God can do with all the rest. It's not only the principle of the tithe, but it's the principle of our lives. It, what we do with the first uh, of our season, if we prioritize that, whatever season we may be coming into, whether we recognize that or not, sometimes we just feel a change and we don't understand why it's changing and we can get anxious or nervous. Um, Sometimes we can get into a stormy season and we can respond in fear and every time we see a cloud building. And then if we have evidence of that, that it can be destructive like we did uh, a year or so ago with the tornado that came through. Now that's, that's a whole different deal. If we see a cloud, that's one thing. If the cloud starts to go in a circle, that's like, well, wait a minute. And we, we respond to that differently. That's not all bad. What it means is that we need to go back to the beginning of those seasons and say, now how do I need to prepare for this season that's coming up? How do I need to establish this in my life? What do I need to prioritize to make sure that I can navigate this season more effectively in my life, learn what God wants me to learn, grow in the areas that God wants me to grow in, and then I can move on much more successfully? Can you say amen? All right, let me quickly give you Five things that I know about seasons. That's not the emphasis on me knowing it. It, It's just that that I've seen this lived out in my life and in people's lives through the years. And so I'm not going to take a lot of time to to back each one of these up with scripture. uh, But it's just practical stuff here. Write this down. First of all, seasons are not determined by schedules and calendars, but by revelation and truth. Seasons are determined by what God reveals to us and the truth that he brings into our life. Truth is not just facts. Truth is the Spirit of God helping us understand the facts. Okay? Just because you uh, are old enough to go to college doesn't mean you're mature enough spiritually to successfully transition in that season okay that comes by a revelation and truth that God brings into our life and responding to that at whatever age we see in scripture that God uses children we see in Jesus life all the way up till he's 12 years old we have a record of his life the last statement about Jesus life is uh, from Luke's gospel is in Luke uh, 2.52, I believe it is, that says Jesus grew in wisdom, stature, and favor with God and man. Jesus grew in wisdom, stature, and favor with God and man. There's an 18-year gap. That's the last thing we hear about Jesus is that he enters this season in his uh, adolescence by growing in wisdom, stature, and favor with God and man. Next statement 
is that his water baptism and his spirit baptism and his commissioning into ministry at 30 years old when the father pours out the Holy Spirit on his life, descends upon him like a dove, and the father said, that's my son whom I love, with whom I'm well pleased, and Jesus thus began his ministry. So for 18 years... Jesus didn't take time off, wasn't just being a knucklehead, wasn't running around being mischievous, whatever, and then getting back on track, you know, because his dad ran the world. He didn't take advantage of those things. He was growing, which the second principle is very key as well, of how you end one season determines how you begin the next. How you end one season determines how you enter the next. How did Jesus end the season of his adolescence and begin the season of his teen years and the growth time during that? He grew in wisdom, stature, and favor with God and man. So when he entered the time of ministry, it wasn't that he had to learn the stuff all over again. It's that he was just growing into it. And here, God was putting stuff in his life in the carpenter shop through his earthly father, Joseph, and through relationships and connections that he really didn't know. Every time his mother told him the the miracle of his birth and how he was conceived and all of that, there was this time of growing in wisdom, stature, and favor with God and man, imparting to him things that he would need as he spoke to other people who didn't understand the things that he was going to do in his life either. And so he had the experience, but it was more than experience. God was giving him revelation and insight, and he was beginning one thing and entering the next in a very powerful way. Here's the third principle. The off-season can make all the difference in the new season. The off-season. That's when not only you end one season, but you're kind of in the in-betweens. In sports, the end of one season before the beginning of the next is called the off season. Uh, some people never get back to the on season. They, they just kind of fade out. But the off season, those are people who continue to train, who sharpen their skills, who get uh, position coaches or hitting coaches in baseball or whatever, who, who uh, go through agility drills and continue to not only stay in shape physically, but hone skills specifically. Not because they have to, but because they want to. Because they want the next season to be better than the last. And so it's not just a natural principle. It's a very powerful one spiritually. That the off season can make all the difference in the new season. If we don't understand what God's doing and in the dry season, we only seek God for his provision. We sang it this morning. Send the rain, send the rain, send the rain, send the rain, send the rain. And because we think that's what we need. It's dry. We need rain. God, you can open the heavens. God, you can send rain. So send rain. What happens before God sends the rain? And what happens after? What happens if God sends the rain, but he sends half an inch? And you're already eight inches behind in the drought scale. Does does it even make a difference? Here's the real principle That before you see the provision, can you stay in praise? Can you stay grateful? Can you stay focused on God? Can you worship your way through an off season so that when you begin a new season, your heart is already established with God? Or do you go through this part where you really struggle in relationships and and you struggle to to figure out why I'm here and, and you doubt the love of God and you doubt his provision in your life and you don't see all these things around you and you talk about being blessed but you don't see the blessing because you've defined the blessing as stuff that comes from God's hand rather than everything that's in God's heart. And instead of seeking God's heart and pressing in in worship during the off season, you're just praying for the new season. You know, that new season to come when, when, when the new season starts. But listen, if you haven't been training in the off season, it's going to take you a while to get going in the new season. And sometimes we get the wrong season. We, we prepared for a season that we expect. It's like a, a, a high school kid that would show up for his first football practice with a glove and a bat. I said his first football practice. You, you don't use gloves and bats in football. Some of you are just now getting that. 
Okay? Listen well, because I'm going to go fast. And, and so it's, it's the right equipment. It's just the wrong season. Okay? It's not time for that. If you want to go out for baseball, that's a different season. This is football season. you got to wear shoulder pads, helmet, whatever. It's like, wait a minute. It's a different skill set. You still run. You, you still catch. But you use both hands, not just the glove hand. There's still some of the same skills involved, but it's a different season. And sometimes what we do is we try to bring the equipment from the old season into the new season. Now, some of that equipment is always in style. And we have the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness. You should always use your spiritual equipment. But you should understand as well that not only do different seasons have different skill sets, different seasons are played with different rules. Okay? You can't use the rules of baseball to play football. You can, but it's totally confusing and you'll never win. And so sometimes God takes us into seasons of spiritual warfare where, where we need to fight the enemies that are there standing on our promise. And sometimes we need to press into that. Other times we need to get in a season of peace where God wants to surround us with his presence but not get so comfortable there that we stop fighting. Amen, Pastor. Thank you, congregation. We're so glad you're home. I'm so glad to be here. I'm just happy today. It's a new season. See, if we haven't learned to walk in faith in the off season, faith is the substance of things hoped for. I hope this season is going to be better than last season. I hope we do a lot better this year than we did last year. I hope the new coach of the Huskers, Mike Riley, is, is, is as close to Tom Osborne as I think that he is. And I'm not living in the past. I'm just seeing it from a standpoint of character. I, I, I hope that my team is good because I love them deeply. I, I, I hope Southern Miss gives them a real good game when they go to Lincoln. But I still hope we win. I'm not against our guys. I'm not against you. If that's your school, I'm just saying. Come on, somebody. It's just a seasonal thing for me. And if that offends you, then wait till after football season and we can fellowship again. Or just wait till after the third game of the season when they play. Listen, sometimes we over-spiritualize things and sometimes we don't prioritize as we begin a new season. And so we get lost in the middle of it. We get overwhelmed. You know the worst thing that happens when we transition in seasons and we don't prioritize the important we begin to be dictated by the urgent, and we become busy at the wrong things. We're playing catch-up. We're, we're getting to that point, oh, I didn't know that, I didn't know that, I didn't do that. And we don't prioritize schedule. We don't prioritize family ministry time. We don't prioritize time in the Word, steady on, going right through it. We, we start that new job. We don't prioritize the important. Here's what I'm going to do. Here's how I'm going to respond. Here's the type of employee I'm going to be. Here's what this is going to require. This is what I'm going to do. And so now we're, we're trying to do the things somebody else wants us to do. We're playing catch up with that. And we get busy in the midst of it. And we don't have time for the important anymore. And we become enslaved to the urgent. And it's not, I'm going to do this because I have planned and this is what I feel like the Lord's calling me to do or leading me to do. Now it's what I have to do because, and, and we cut things out that we need to be adding to, that we just don't have time for that because we're so consumed and so busy with stuff that God hadn't called us to in that season. Because we never prioritized, we never made room for that. We never left ourselves any margin, and, and so what we do is we're just, we're going, going, going. How many just look at life that way, and so, sometimes we go, man, I just, this has just been a busy season. That should be a real caution word for us as believers, because every season, God has called us to walk in peace. The reason he established the Sabbath is so we would walk in a rhythm of rest, preview for next week, but how many of us go through Sunday and Saturday and every other day when God's calling us, when are you going to take a break? Now I'm just busy. 
And then we can get busy with church activities but never rest in God because we don't trust him. And we don't have a Sabbath. And then we just kind of, oh, that's Old Testament. Really? Then why does Hebrews say the promise of entering God's rest still stands? There remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. And rest isn't just sleeping. Rest is letting go. Rest is just stop trying to hold it so much. Go busy, busy, busy. Do it. Grind it out. Get it. Make it. Do, 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 do. And have a little five-minute time. And, and, and did we have family time? Did we have honey time? Did we have whatever? Are we get stuff? And oh, man, there's 16 things and the car broke down. Oh, great. And now, all of a sudden, our attitude, why? Because we feel this pressure. Where's the pressure come from? The pressure comes from the fact that we're in a season that we haven't prepared for and we haven't expected. And God wants us to walk us, navigate us through those seasons of life in a very powerful way. Here's the fourth thing. God gives us signs to mark seasons. Hey, we read it in Genesis 1. Psalm 104, 19 says the same thing. He made the moon to mark the seasons. Hey, the Jewish calendar is based on a lunar calendar, on the calendar of the stages of the moon. That's why some of the dates change from time to time. Uh, it's why it's so significant in making the moon the marker of the seasons that even now, some of the prophetic words about the times in which we live involve changes with the moon that are visible. Uh, a series of blood moons where, where the moon appears red. Prophesied hundreds of years ago in God's wisdom as a sign to mark the season. But listen, if we don't understand the season that we enter into and how we walk that out and we haven't prioritized and our hearts aren't established in Him, then it becomes a thing that produces fear instead of us walking in faith and going, well, there's the sign, this must be the season. Matthew 24, Jesus spoke the words and He said, even you know that when the fig, leaf blossom, when the fig tree blossoms, when there's figs, on the vine, it's the sign that the summer season is here. God gave signs to mark seasons. We'll look in just a minute how Jesus used a fig tree to drive the principle home in a very powerful way. But it's important that we understand as we walk through how these principles are very practical but tremendously uh, important and spiritual in our life. Here's the last one, very practical thing. Seasons are navigated by spirit and word. Seasons are navigated by spirit and word. That's very important. They're, they're not navigated because uh, September 5th was determined by the NCAA to be the, the start of college football season. Okay, Spiritually, seasons in our life are navigated by spirit and word. And if we don't understand how God helps us navigate through those seasons and come back to the assurance of his word, th then we get caught up like the disciples did. Um, in fact, the scripture says we're to be prepared in every season. 2 Timothy 4.2. But it starts by saying, preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. In other words... All the time, we need to be prepared for the seasons that we're coming out of or the seasons that we're going into, or we need to continue to prepare in the off-season. How? Through the Word of God. Here's another one, very important, but we miss it so many times. Most of us know, uh, uh, charismatic believers would know Acts 1-8, the, the promise of power when Jesus sends the Spirit. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you shall be my witnesses. Okay? How many know what Acts 1 7 says? Jesus was talking to the same disciples. It's the context. They said, Lord, are you at this time going to restore your kingdom? They wanted him to come set up earthly rule, deal with Caesar, overthrow the Roman Empire, and sit on the throne, and they're going to help him rule. Is that going to happen now? Is that going to happen now? 
Are you going to restore your kingdom at this time? Because all you talked about was the kingdom. And you talked about the cross and the crucifixion, and we missed all that. But now that you're resurrected, kingdom, kingdom. And Jesus said, it is not for you to know the times or seasons set by the Father. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Don't miss the connection. It's not for you to know the times or seasons set by the Father. Well, I thought God established seasons. He did. Well, I thought he gave us signs to mark the seasons. He did. But if we get focused on when Jesus is going to return or when the Father is going to establish his kingdom on earth and, and we're looking forward to the date or the time, then our season is dictated by a calendar and by knowledge, not by revelation and spirit. That we don't walk in the power of the Holy Spirit because he helps us navigate through every season. If it's the season of Jesus paying the price and dying on the cross, then by the power of the Spirit, we can navigate through that season. If it's a season of loss, if it's a season where we don't understand the words that he said, but we're walking in the Spirit, he can give us revelation of what he said. And Jesus said, destroy this temple, I'll raise it in three days. When they destroyed the temple, they were devastated. That's not right. That's not fair. That's not even a real trial. That, that, it, it, and they miss the fact that it's not the destruction of the temple. It's three days. Three days, I'm going to rise again. Uh, at Lazarus' tomb. But Lord, I know he'll, he'll live at the resurrection. I am the resurrection and the life. See, and if we walk in the Spirit, then the season is just the... the a different dimension of us exercising the faith that comes by hearing the word. Faith doesn't come through understanding the time. If you knew when Jesus was going to return, you wouldn't be living by faith. You'd be living either in expectancy or fear because you know what's going to surround it. And faith only comes by hearing the word. Faith doesn't come by having the information. Okay, let me say it another way. If you knew the exact day that you would die, would you want to know it? You'd have many more questions. Well, how am I going to die? Well, well, is anybody going to come to my funeral? Uh, am I going to suffer? Uh, how can I be prepared? See, and it would take away much of the dimension of you walking in faith and trusting God, not just for the days and the seasons of your life, but every breath that comes from him. And giving our lives back to him every day and saying, Lord, use me. Use me in a way in this day. Help me understand the season. Help me understand as I navigate through these things in life how significant this is that I live my life for you. In every season, as we walk in the Spirit and the power of God's Word, it becomes an incredible thing. Here's the last thing I want to leave you with. Uh, Jesus, in Mark 11, is uh, starting the triumphal entry. In fact, they come into Jerusalem, then they go back out of the city, and then they, as they come back in, it describes this scenario where Jesus sees a fig tree in leaf, and he's hungry. So he goes over to the tree to find out if it has any figs on it. And he looks under the leaves, and when it doesn't have any figs, he curses the fig tree and, and says, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And then they go on about their day, come back by the next morning, and the disciples say, Look, Lord, the fig tree that you cursed is withered. And Jesus uses it as a teaching opportunity to tell them, Listen, if you have faith, you can say to a mountain, Be cast into the sea. You, you can do greater things if you believe what you receive in prayer. Now, the principle here is really misunderstood because it's not about Jesus being cranky and hungry and when he didn't get some lunch, he, he had an attitude, so he cursed a fig tree. It's not near as much about the cursing as it is about the process of seasons that Jesus understands that many times we don't. That before figs form on a fig tree, that, that would have been early April, uh, that figs won't form until summer. 
but before that is a blossom that is edible and many times was the, the food of the peasants. Since they couldn't have these orchards, they would go up and pick the buds off of the fig trees that would bloom in early April. And the scripture specifically said it was not the season for figs. So you think, then why is Jesus holding the tree accountable for something contrary to its nature? It, it can't produce figs early. Okay, Remember the principle. The way to navigate seasons is what? Spirit and word. And when we walk in the spirit and we walk in the word of God, there's not a dry season. There's not a season where we're not prepared because the fruit of the, the spirit is never out of season. Against such there is no law. There's laws for hunting seasons and laws for different seasons and principles in our life. There are uh, certain areas of the country. There are laws where you have to have uh, chains on your tires or certain types of tires to drive on roads. And you say, well, man, that's an infringement on my freedom. No, it's a safety issue because of what happens during that season. Are you with me here? And so when we understand that when God brings us into a season and we're walking in the spirit and we're established in the word of God, then we're fully equipped and prepared because we're walking in faith and we have the power. It's not for you to know the times and the seasons, but it is for you to, to receive the power of the Holy Spirit so that when you walk into the new season, you're already walking in power. You're not walking in weakness. You're not walking out of loss of what you had in the last season. You're walking fully prepared and equipped for the new season because the, the abundance of the fruit of the Spirit produces in your life all the time. Here's the last thing I want you to get. Galatians chapter 6 is one of our favorite scriptures talking about answers to prayer. It says, don't be weary in well-doing, for in due season you will reap if you do not faint. Then it goes on, talks about uh, forgiveness and don't, don't stop doing good and continue on. Be, be steady. What's the principle? Don't season always comes before due season. I know that's really deep. Don't miss it. Don't be weary in well-doing. For in due season, you will reap if you don't quit. So before you get to due season, where you are due the harvest on your prayers and your good works and your faith and your commitment and all of that in staying steady, before you get to due season, don't quit. Don't stop. Don't get weary. Don't get bitter. Don't get offended. Don't start walking in unforgiveness. Don't season always precedes due season. And when you walk into the due season, then you have a heart that's clean, that you have strength because you haven't gotten weary before you've seen the fulfillment of the promise. And you walk into the new season and you're able to receive everything that God has for you to receive in that season because you, you successfully navigated out of the old season into the new season. Because how you finish one season determines how you enter the next. I hope you're, you're not shouting because you're processing. But I also hope that the processing produces a shouting and a revelation of how God wants to, you to navigate through your life. I feel very strongly that there's some folks here this morning that are in a very difficult season. And you've actually prayed, Lord, I need a new season. Or send the rain in this season. And you haven't understood the full work that God wants to do because he wants you to grow in every season. Churches go through seasons. Families go through seasons. Marriages go through seasons. And we as individuals go through seasons. One season doesn't last forever. But the dry seasons last a whole lot longer than the harvest seasons. But there's a whole different perspective in the harvest season. Okay, sometimes we got to, Jesus didn't tell us to pray about the season. Jesus said, pray about the workers because the fields are already ripe to harvest. In God's kingdom, it's always harvest season. Okay, but we don't always see that. And with us, there's seed time and then there's harvest. And what is there in between? Waiting. 
you can't make the seed grow. Okay? You, you can carry water, but you can't carry enough water that God could send in one rainstorm. And, and so there's that waiting period, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. You don't grow weary in well-doing. You're looking toward due season, when the crops come due, not just the rent. When, when the, the harvest is ready and when God prepares that which he's put in your heart that you've prayed through and processed and you get to that point and then it's a matter of stepping into it and realizing God's been preparing me for this. But if not, you get discouraged or you get defeated. You get stuck in a season and then you wrestle through. You begin to wrestle with the relationships in that season because you haven't understood where God has you. And as you enter a new season, it just becomes too much. I'm convinced we don't understand the process of navigating seasons. And so some people, instead of navigating seasons, navigate to another church. Some people, instead of navigating through seasons where it's difficult, navigate to another marriage relationship. Navigate to another job. Navigate to another house. Navigate to another... Because they don't go through the seasons successfully. And I think from the beginning, God wanted us to get it. That he's more than a conqueror, and he wants you to be one too. And sometimes we don't feel real victorious in a season. In fact, we go through a season where we feel defeated. And so we realize, is that the end? What am I going to learn? Sometimes we can learn more in our defeats than we do in our victories. Because we're so busy celebrating the victory, we don't process it. Wait a minute. How did I get here? What does God want me to do? What, what battles? Or sometimes we're so tired, we just want to recoup. The off season is for that, but we expect and step into a new season in God. And I believe as we respond to him, he meets us in a powerful way that every season can be a season of God's blessing in our life. Because we realize if I'm growing down, that's a blessing. If I'm growing up, that's a blessing. Sometimes if I'm a tree and I'm growing wider, that's a blessing. If I'm a person, not so much. But sometimes I'm growing in wisdom. Sometimes I'm growing in stature. Sometimes I'm growing in favor with God. That's a good thing. Sometimes I'm growing in favor with men because I'm serving them and serving God at the same time. It's what Jesus did so that when he stepped into ministry, even the enemy in face-to-face -face confrontation couldn't defeat him. Someone said the measure of a man is determined by uh, the, the goals that he sets in his life and the price he's willing to pay for its achievement. The other side is what it takes to defeat him. Mentally, physically, emotionally, or spiritually. And God wants to bring us into seasons where whatever it has for us, we look with faith and expectancy because his power, his strength is more than enough. Can somebody else say amen this morning? Can we pray about seasons? Just put your stuff aside and let's pray together. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you that you came so that we could overcome as well. And Lord, not only did you defeat every enemy that we will face, even death, but you did it with a spirit of triumph bringing victory in our life so that every season could be a season of expectancy. Father, every loss of releasing seed would just be a time of expectancy of the harvest that's going to come from it at whatever level. Father, I pray for every spirit of discouragement sent against people and pray for the, the power of the enemy working against us just like he did you to get us off track. And I pray that we would navigate by spirit and word and that your word would be a light to our path when it's dark, when it's narrow, when it's difficult, pray that it would be a light to us as we walk with you, Lord. Pray that you would lead us through seasons in our life where 
we're not sure and we don't know. That you would lead us in seasons where we rejoice and dance as well as the seasons where we mourn and grieve. Father, I pray those seasons where we battle for things and the seasons where we just enjoy the peace of God that passes our understanding would all be markers in times in our life where we just need to gather again with you on a Sabbath day to celebrate consistently through the seasons the God who is more than enough. Father, I pray for every person this morning in whatever season they would find themselves, that their hearts would turn to you, that, Lord, we would look to you and find the strength that we have, the wisdom that we need, and that the revelation and the truth that you want to establish in our heart for every season would be ours, but would be found in you and you alone. God, that we wouldn't yield to the temptation to operate in wisdom and understanding that is only from ourselves, just the information that we can glean. Father, we would operate in revelation that only the Spirit of God can bring, the insight into His Word that helps us know not only who we are, but where we are as we're walking through the seasons of life. Father, we praise you and we thank you for it. Now with heads bowed and eyes closed all over the building, you just say, Pastor, that was a word for me, the season that I am. And I'm determined this morning that I'm going to walk it through, that I'm going to face this season even if it's difficult, or I'm going to come out of a season and realize, man, I missed it there. I made some mistakes. And so I'm going to come out of that season in repentance. God's going to reestablish my heart and give me strength to walk ahead that I'm going to go through don't season before I start asking him for do season and I'm not going to get discouraged I'm not going to get defeated I'm not going to get bitter I'm not going to get let a fence work in my heart I'm going to navigate through don't season then I'm going to ask God in do season Father let me harvest let me receive because I did not faint everybody that agree with that just raise your hand all over the building Hallelujah. That's me. That's me. Lift the other hand right there. Father, I'm just agreeing with people in seasons of their life right now. Father, people that have walked out of seasons and realize I'm not going to live in fear. That's not my season. I'm a person of faith. I'm going to live in you. Father, I'm going to walk out of a season of lack, and I'm going to step into a season of abundance, and I'm believing you for that. I'm going to be grateful. Father, not in, for what I don't have, but for the little bit I do. I'm going to be grateful for your faithfulness. I'm going to be thankful. I'm going to fill my heart with praise. Lord, I'm going to walk out of a dry season, and, and I'm going to find those deep wells that are of God. And, and I'm going to draw deeply from those waters and wells of salvation. And Father, we thank you for that. We give you praise and glory this morning because you are more than enough. Come on, somebody. Can you say amen? Glory to God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Is Miss Sally here this morning? Sally Perkins? Come on, don't be bold. No, don't be shy. Stand up, Miss Sally. Right there. In fact, come on down here. We want to pray for you. Miss Sally is entering a new season. Next week, she will be journeying to Bolivia to spend a few months there ministering to my grandbabies. Hallelujah. So we're sending 10,000 pounds of candy and clothes and stuff and things, missionary essentials with her and uh, a bunch of stuff. So we just wanted to pray over her this morning uh, as she steps into a new season in her life. This morning, this is a huge step of faith and she just came several months ago and said, this is what God put on our heart. It was a surprise to us. Aren't you, don't you love the surprise seasons in God? And uh, we just agreed and prayed and said, we're going to take it one step at a time. So here we are. So let's just kind of use this as a focal point this morning. And then anybody else just wants to connect at a point, if God's dealing with you deeply about the season that you're in or the season that you're going into, or you don't understand that process in your life, then we'll have some prayer teams here this morning just to agree and to pray with you. and God's going to see us through. And I just declare over our church, as we declare over Sally's life this morning as our point of contact, it is a new season. It's a new day. And that it's a season of blessing coming into our lives. 
Now let's pray over Sally, can we? Father, in Jesus' name, we just thank you this morning that as we navigate seasons of life that we don't expect, and some, Lord, we don't ever want to walk through, but we do. We see your faithfulness. We see your hand. Lord, we see that you are so faithful in saying, all that concerns us, you will indeed take care of. So we realize, Lord, the concern on Sally's heart isn't just the logistics of visa and and travel and all of that, what it's going to be like here in another country for a few months. Father, what's really on her heart is her children, her family. God, that which you've established, what you're doing in this season of her life. God, what you're doing in her life as far as income and business and what she's prepared for. And now it seems like there's a changing of the seasons. And so, Lord, we thank you that you lead us through every one of those successfully, powerfully. We pray, Lord, that you would open doors of revelation and insight, not only now, but, Father, as she makes this and as she walks with you. Lord, you promise not only to lead us season to season and year to year, but to order our very steps. Lord, into the next step. And sometimes we're one step away from a brand new season, and we don't realize it. Father, we're one step away from that season of faith that you've called us to walk in. And God, just mustering the strength to take that next step out of the boat. Take that next step to uh, get the passport. Take that next step for the the visa process and, and book the ticket. Lord, here we are. So this morning we surround her with faith. Thank you for the power of prayer and agreement. We pray, Lord God, that blessing would just go before her. God, your favor would completely surround her. The the Psalm 139 anointing that you go before her and behind her, set your hand upon her, completely hemming her in to your presence in Jesus' name. Father, I pray that she would find the, the blessing of this new season and just ways to serve and what you want to do in her as well as what you want to do through her. In Jesus' mighty name. God, we thank you that our going out is blessed, our coming in is blessed, everything in our life is blessed when we give our lives to you. So we do that this morning, we praise you and we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Sally said, and everybody else said, come on, let's rejoice in the Lord, everybody. Glory to God. Amen, amen. Hey, prayer teams, if you would come down here to the front and uh, everybody, if you'd stand together. May the blessing of God be on your life. May you understand the season in which you live and God's purpose for it in your life. May you look with expectancy and faith to the season that you're moving toward. May you prioritize God and His power, His Spirit, His Word as you walk into the new season that God has for you. May it be a season of blessing and faith and expectancy in Jesus' mighty name. Everybody who received the blessing of the Lord said, amen. We're blessed to be a blessing. So find someone this morning, bless them in Jesus' name. Tell them to be here on a Wednesday night, 6.30. It's going to be a blessing. Next Sunday morning as we continue talking about the power of seasons, any need in your life, connect with the prayer team. Somebody that's here, we'd love to pray with you. God bless you, everybody. Have a wonderful day.